Bonjour, je ne sais pas si vous êtes là. Bonjour. Voilà. Je me sens super fort. <rire> je vais essayer de sonner. Ouais, c'est vrai qu'il y a un petit, un petit écho. Ça doit être moi. Ça doit être moi. Est-ce que vous m'entendez euh, bien ou pas Là, c'est parfait. Ouais. On, en fait, on a regardé. Quelqu'un avait activé la spatialisation. Ah, donc, il euh, fallait être proche de nous pour vous entendre tout à l'heure. Mais je crois, je crois que la spatialisation n'est toujours pas là parce qu'il y a, a quelqu'un d'autre qui essaie de parler, enfin qui parle au loin, on n'entend pas. Non, ça y est, c'est non. Enfin, c'est les zones bleues. C'est pour ça que je suis Alors, là, les, ah, elles sont activées, les zones bleues ah, Ouais, c'est pour ça que j'ai demandé à, à Pauline quand est-ce qu'on les désactive. Par contre, euh, on va peut-être avoir un souci parce qu'on est tous les deux dans, la, dans on est deux présentateurs qui parlent tous les deux à 10h dans la toute petite salle euh, physiquement sur place. Ah Donc, je ne sais pas si vous l'entendez, là, il est en train de parler. On l'entend On l'entend en fond, ouais, un peu. Ouais. ouais. Bon, après, on ne peut pas faire tellement mieux parce qu'il y a beaucoup d'écho dans la salle. Et, euh, et j'ai une autre question. Comment on fait pour revenir en arrière dans les slides Parce que quand euh, je clique, en fait, je, je clique en avant. Il y a une petite flèche en bas à droite, ouais. en fait. Euh, je ne sais pas si vous voyez les petites flèches bleues. Ouais. Du coup, Alors, on euh... la flèche de gauche pour revenir en arrière. Et si ah oui, ça marche. Et c'est l'aide étrange. Je vais juste vérifier. C'est ça. Euh, sinon, c'est clic droit de la souris. Clic gauche pour avancer, clic droit pour revenir en arrière. Je pourrais avancer, clic droit, voilà, ça fera ma mort. Ah, ok, c'est bon. Euh, ok, et si je veux, euh, pour ma vie, il faudrait que je prenne le contrôle de l'écran. Il faut que je fasse euh, euh, Burger Icon. Et. Euh, oula. Ah, ça y est. Euh, prenez possession. Ok. Et. Euh, Comment ça marche Vous me donnez un go ou quelque chose euh, Alors, je bah, me pensais la même chose. Je crois que c'est vous qui donnez le go. Si vous la prenez. Enfin, moi, je lance, euh... je lance à 10h, mais après, je ne sais pas si vous attendez 10h, 10h05, ou plus de monde, moins de monde. Euh, vous avez... nous, enfin, pour nous, d'après nous, vous avez jusqu'à 10h10. Vraiment, c'est vous qui, qui faites jusqu'à 10h10. Vraiment. Et puis après, si euh, voilà, 10h10, euh, vous n'avez pas fini, parce qu'on vous enverra un petit message en chat, en chat privé pour vous dire de, de conclure et de passer à, à la personne suivante. Ok, bah, de toute façon, moi, j'ai mes calculs, mes slides, je, en gros, 10 minutes, hein, j'essaie de faire comme je okay. peux. Euh, c'est surtout que je crois que vous enregistrez peut-être derrière quelque chose, ou je ne sais pas, donc c'est pour savoir quand est-ce que je commence. Est euh, vraiment, pile à 10 heures. D'accord. Okay. L'enregistrement tourne déjà, normalement. Euh, ok. C'est euh, les deux personnes que vous voyez en face euh, qui se... qui s'occupent beaucoup de la captation, et donc normalement, c'est euh, actif depuis, euh, depuis 9 heures, 9 heures 30 oh. D'accord. Euh, par contre, moi j'avais une question qui ne nous a ouais. pas donné trop d'informations sur ça. C'est par rapport au fait que. Est-ce que c'est vous qui introduisez les autres euh, speakers ou pas Alors, euh, moi ce que j'ai juste fait, c'est que dans mon slide, je vous dis euh, bonjour à tout le monde en anglais. Et ensuite, je dis bah, bah, c'est le slide suivant en fait. Euh, je dis voilà, il y aura, euh, on va avoir une super euh, matinale avec euh, quatre super speakers. Mais par contre, okay. je ne donne pas leur nom. Okay, euh, et à la fin que de ma présentation, je termine en disant bah, maintenant je laisse la parole aux quatre speakers. Ok, c'est eux qui se lèvent et qui viennent tour à tour. Euh, voilà. Et, et, je, okay. et je crois que euh, Sven, qui est le premier des speakers, il n'est pas là aujourd'hui, qu'il a enregistré son talk. Et donc, ah ouais euh, donc euh, il faut que vous le diffusiez. <rire> okay. Et la diffusion, c'est. Euh, je ne sais vous. pas du tout, j'ai juste vu des mails passer dans lesquels il disait euh, je ne peux pas être là, mais par contre, euh, on a enregistré mon talk. Est-ce que vous pourrez me, me faire bah, Je pense qu'ils vont le mettre dans le chat. Ouais. Ok. Oui, je pense que la première fois, ça, ça sera plus simple. Sinon, ça, ça va un peu laguer. Mmh. Écran. Tu as raison. Et à euh, ah. la question bête. Euh, il, moi, il faut que je me mette devant, en fait. C'est ça. Yes. C'est ça, ouais. Là, j'ai oublié qu'on a. Là, on entend plus le fond que. Oui, c'est ça. Ah ouais, mais alors, les autres, je ne peux pas faire, <rire> pas faire mieux. Non, pas je, je couperai mon micro à chaque fois que je ne parlerai pas. Mais par contre, on va tous les deux parler et introduire euh, tous les deux nos talks en même temps dans la même salle. D'ailleurs, je ne sais pas si vous avez testé, mais avec le euh, menu burger, euh, vous pouvez déjà cliquer, quand vous pouvez réduire complètement cliquer euh, dessus pour faire avancer. Euh, ou reculer les slides. Ah, okay. On va avoir à cliquer sur le grand écran derrière. Ok. Bah là, ouais, je clique à fond euh, sur mon mini écran. Euh, ouais. 
Et aussi, n'hésitez pas si vous avez un écran noir. Euh, ah, ah, ouais, ouais. En, en haut à droite ah. de, de, chaque, de chaque grand écran. Euh, J'ai pas compris. Un écran ah, noir. Pardon. Si vous avez un écran noir qui s'affiche, n'hésitez pas à rafraîchir. En haut à droite de chaque grand écran, vous avez un, des petits onglets, un pour zoomer et un pour rafraîchir. Ah, euh, quand on regarde le, 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 la scène ou euh... Non, non, parce que des fois, ça, que c'est possible qu'un écran noir s'affiche euh, lors de la présentation. Même sur le petit menu dragueur, en fait. Ah, d'accord. Et, euh, et ben, par contre, je vois pas de truc à rafraîchir. Enfin, si, je vois une icône euh... à rafraîchir, mais... Euh... C'est ça. C'est juste à côté okay. de, la, de la maison. Et ça va pas me faire repartir au début du slide enfin, au non. Début des... non, non. Ok. Enfin, je pourrais surtout vous faire un test avec la deuxième ou troisième slide, rafraîchir et voir ben, si ça... Normalement, non. Je crois que je suis là, et là, je suis rafraîchi. Ok, d'accord. Ouais, bon, j'ai essayé de viser 10 minutes, hein. après, euh, je vais... Ah oui, non, t'as enregistré, mais on plus court. Ah, ok, ça va Ah, je vais le je serai peut-être un, je vous ferai peut-être une pause entre le passage de chaque slide au moment où je parle parce que comme c'est pas immédiat euh, j'aurai peut-être un lag de une seconde Okay, and
Et Jean-Philippe Ouais. Je vais désactiver les zones bleues, donc euh, les gens vont pouvoir s'entendre. On vous entend. D'accord. Je commence du coup. Vous pouvez y aller. Ok, so good morning to everyone, welcome. I hope you enjoy your trip to this reality. Today we are, have an amazing journey with amazing speaker who will talk about uh, transversal tech and uh, alternate realities. And then we will do a round table to talk with uh, all the panel later. But Let's step back a little bit uh, and let's talk about alternate realities. In 1988, I used to, to play with virtual reality and the first feedback blog. It was 23 years ago. And now, in 2021, it's still a work in progress. Why? Well, uh, it is because there is so much expectation from science fiction that uh, people are afraid and don't understand. And so there's lots of deceptions. It's the problem of the magician. When you do a magic trick, if you see the trick, uh, there's lots of deceptions. And uh, the idea is to be focused to the story of the magicians, not uh, the trick. So uh, to do that, uh, if we look at the retail, uh, uh, and if, I don't know if you know uh, Amazon Go. Amazon Go is a, is a retail store where you go in the store, you find a product, you take it, and you leave it. And that's all, and you get billed after. When I told that to my mother, she said, wow, what's happened? Uh, I'm not ready for that. Just, just please wait 10 years. And I said, but uh, be ready because the next step is you will be able to buy virtual things to a virtual assistant in a virtual store to power up your virtual avatar. So uh, be ready with that because uh, it's the future. And she said, hmm, I'm okay with that. In fact, the problem is that um, it's not about buying something physical or digital. The problem is changing behavior. You need to have a very seamless experience in order to, to accept change. So uh, that's the problem. And to power up uh, the alternate realities, I think that we need to converge. It's something common. Uh, we can call it metaverse. And uh, the idea is to have common building blocks to be able to share at large scale things. The good things and the good idea is that for 10 years, people test a lot of things in uh, alternate realities and now big companies are converging in the same way. So I don't know if we are in um, uh, also I mean alternate realities like uh, Elon Musk said, but I do know that we need to, to go in something common. First, we need to digitalize places. Uh, we have Google Earth and Google uh, Street View. Now we need to digitize inside places. And we have companies like Matterport, who is 10 years old, who partner with Facebook, who is working with Insta360 to digitize places at scale. And they are going public. So it's, uh, there's many other companies doing things like that, but the idea is that we are going at scale for places. Then we also need to go at scale to make people work together. And this is the idea also. Uh, we need, uh, we have Microsoft Mesh who provide a way to digitalize uh, people and to help them work together in a place or with avatar. Uh, and also Apple and Google is working on the same kind of technology, Mesh technology. And they try to share the model uh, between each other. Then, Last thing, we need to also digitalize things, objects, to sell it, buy it, uh, share it, and things like that. The good things is that uh, iPhone 12 has been sold 100 million in the past six months. It's huge. It means that lots of people are, are a leader in the end and are able to digitalize uh, objects. So it will change the, the game and it will move it at scale, I hope. But that's not all. Brands are also ready. Uh, for instance, Gucci uh, did lots of experience, but many brands do the same things with Snapchat. Snapchat provides the tools to be able to perform virtual try on and many other stuff, like uh, having a Bitmoji, uh, it's kind of avatar, with all your virtual stuff on. 
Uh, Amazon also is, uh, has dropped a patent about uh, your digital self and how uh, you will have your digital stuff on your digital self and you will buy faster, better, and so on. And on the other side, we have companies like LVMH or MasterCard that is working on a blockchain consortium in order to tag uh, to use a non-fungible token to your uh, digital assets. So when you buy something, you will be able to sell it again or to attach it to physical object. So things are moving on also on one side. Now let's move from retail to gaming. Gaming is a huge industry, specifically video game, because people with the pandemic are at home, but also connected and streaming what they do. So it's a huge bomb, and that's why a company like Walt Disney uh, perform a video like uh, wants to, to perform video like streaming of game of esports. That's also why Netflix is looking at buying a company to do gaming. So it's new brand coming into the game, and uh, game like Demeo is providing uh, things like virtual tabletop in virtual reality. The problem, like Amazon Go, you don't have the user experience. And here is the Internet of Things. Uh, on the on the side of my slide, uh, there is a smart device called Pixels. It's uh, an Internet of Things object that you roll. You have the pleasure of rolling a dice, but it is connected and send it to the cloud. So you have both of the both of world, the pleasure, the user experience, and the gaming. Then, oops. Moving on, uh, Internet of Things is everywhere. I, I don't have time to, to talk about it, but let's just watch two patterns very interesting from Disney. Disney want to build animatronics in their theme park. So this time it's avatar, virtual avatar coming to life in real life. It's the other way. It's very interesting because you will interact with your favorite characters and it's going further. They, they drop also a patent about merchandise fixtures in retail. So let's say you are in a retail store and maybe toys will talk to you, will interact with you. So it can go very far and again, we connect the virtual and the physical world. And everything is possible because of artificial intelligence. Uh, again, there's many things to talk about artificial intelligence, but let's focus on two things. First, we have all the technologies to uh, have intelligent avatar. I mean, avatar that can understand what they see, uh, interact with you, speech, react, have knowledge, and things like that. Uh, they, but there is also another technology very interesting, is generative adaptive networks. It's, it's NVIDIA that provide a lot of demo about that. The idea is to be able to generate things from nothing. For instance, when you look at the camera, you're talking in your web conference, they digitalize you, then they recreate yourself, a better place, a better version of yourself. Looking at the camera, maybe with a corrective dress, things like that. And uh, applied to VR, they do the same thing. They take uh, an image, uh, sometimes the image are not wide enough, and they generate the content of the side in order to be able to watch the image 360. So AI is everywhere and is moving on faster and faster. But do we really need a headset at last? Does the better user experience, the more seamless experience is no headset? I don't know. Uh, maybe the panel will answer. We will have someone from HTC. Uh, what we know is that some companies are building theme park of holograms. Uh, TV, screen, more and more uh, screen are transparent or provide holograph versions. And lens are smaller and smaller. So maybe in the future we won't need or we won't see any headset or things like that. But stop talking about the headset. What about the other stuff? What about haptic feedback or uh, sense or smelling? Uh, maybe the next step also is to move at scale all, the, all this kind of technology and maybe to have a better user experience. The best thing to do is, uh, is the brain interface. So I mean uh, uh, hacking the brain in order to send data and receive data. I don't know. There's many questions about that, but I'm just introducing this subject to all our speakers that will talk now. 
So I'm very happy to, to let the mic and I thank you. I hope you will enjoy this journey and uh, I will be back uh, for the round table uh, at noon. Thank you. Je vous entends plus très bien. Ah, pardon, euh, non, non, c'est parce que tu es derrière moi et euh, je pense que tu as introduit un moment euh, Zidane. Il y avait une vidéo sur le sujet. Normalement, la vidéo, c'est normalement quelqu'un va l'introduire. So thank you everyone. Uh, now we, we will have a, a short break of uh, four minutes. Uh, and so Zven or someone will put a, a video on the screen. Or we'll send you a link. So you'll be able to, to access the video. So we will try um, something. The staff told me that uh, Zven is coming and we will play um, a video. Uh, does anybody have questions about uh, the slide or things like that? I could answer. To access, I don't know if I will be able to hear you and answer, but uh, I can try. 
So in the upcoming session, we will have um, a, a, a recorded talk about um, volumetric capture from uh, Sven. Uh, we uh, have uh, issues and problems about how to capture correctly volume, volume of a uh, free object, like I talked uh, previously. And there's lots of challenge to, to perform, I think, uh, how to compress all that quantity of data to be fast enough to perform live um, transferring and things like that. Um, then we will have a talk from uh, Niantic, from Gabriel Brosto. Then we will uh, have uh, the introduction of uh, Vive Focus and Vive Focus Pro from Hervé Fontaine uh, from HTC. And then uh, we will talk again about volumetric streaming over 5G from uh, Mauricio Arcana and Tom Decrim. And uh, at the end of uh, all these talks, we will try to perform a roundtable to talk about uh, with each people of the panel of the future of uh, alternate realities. I like the, 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 the world of alternate realities because it's virtual realities, augmented realities, mixed realities, holograms, and all the technology that uh, was today. Maybe Thank you, Jean-Philippe. Uh, well, we have an issue with Sven, like uh, Jean-Philippe said, so we will be back in uh, 15 minutes or so with uh, the next conference. Thank you very much. And it will be uh, Gabriel's turn, I think. He's here.
Yes, Gabriel. Yes, hello. Yeah, yeah. You 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 can go on stage. Uh, the stage is yours. Uh, and you you will be about to st start in uh three minutes. In three minutes. Okay. Can yeah. I go ahead and set up? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, do it. I can set up on screen. So one one thing we encountered is a. Um, uh, I was hoping to load onto the side screen a yeah. uh, a JPEG image. Uh, it wasn't working the VIP mount, but uh, it, it was simply not loading. Can I give it a try here? Yeah, absolutely. The main presentation is working fine, so I, I have no no main, no no big scares or worries. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, no but uh, yeah, I can't I can't explain it. This loads just fine uh, in my browser, you know, and uh, I, I, without logging in or anything. Um, somehow, single single JPEG is is eluding us. Yeah, I can see that. It's still loading. Um, yeah. So perhaps I'll I'll come up with a different solution. Let me let me do that instead. Then. Um, can I have different presentations on different screens? Yeah, if it helps you. Fine by me. Okay. All right. Um, A quick question. Yeah. Um, when I right now I'm speaking, am I speaking to everyone or just you? Right now, to everyone. Everyone oh, okay. can hear you. Yeah. Everyone can hear me. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't I don't need to do any anything special to uh, to turn that on. Very good. That's no, perfect. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Looking good, uh, good for you, uh, Gabe. Yes, uh, I'm ready to start. If uh, if uh, if I should start now, or tell me if I. Yeah, uh, you can start now. You, okay. You can do it. Yeah. Have fun. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right.
right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Gabriel Brasto. I'm the Chief Research Scientist uh, at Niantic, and I look after the R&D team there. So thank you for coming to this virtual event. It's very exciting, and I am uh, grateful to be here. Um, I'll be telling you uh, a slice of what we're doing in trying to expand the AR capabilities uh, at Niantic and also in, in general through, um, through our research and through our platform. So uh, first it's worth uh, maybe uh, reminding people that Niantic, if you haven't heard of the company, um, is responsible for uh, making and running a uh, number of games, including Ingress and Pokemon Go. Uh, so you might have heard of some of them. And then uh, most recently, we've been doing Settlers and uh, Pikmin, but also uh, now the Heavy Metal game uh, has been announced. So this is uh, Transformers. So uh, there, there's a lot uh, to gaming and a lot to uh, good interfaces and AR. Um, but I'm going to focus in particular on that uh, on that upper right corner where it says ARDK. So this is an SDK for creating AR. Uh, now I appreciate this is a VR conference, so uh, we'll talk about that in, in a moment. Um, the AR capabilities that we have developed first for one game and then for another game eventually uh, start to resemble a platform. And th this is now an actual effort, uh, explicit effort that we have made uh, to release that platform for use by other developers uh, in case they want to do similar things, not just games, but anything to do with um, trying to understand the world around us and to augment it. Uh, and I think both of these are really uh, relevant, especially um, for VR, which was my first passion, um, because this connection between the real world atoms and the digital bits is really important. Um, and especially in, uh, in my team, the R&D team, uh, we really care about trying to, uh, to communicate between the two uh, as, as faithfully as possible. Uh, so uh, overall, uh, our internal sort of structure uh, means that we have uh, teams focusing on uh, different pillars of, of augmented reality. Uh, and so you could think of us as splitting it up between um, sharing uh, experiences between multiple users, uh, understanding reality, uh, which is the one I'm going to focus on, and, and then mapping, um, which I will touch on as well, because really it goes, goes together with the other two uh, in, in substantial ways. So uh, in this brief uh, uh, meeting with you today, I'm, I'm really going to just focus on understanding. Um, and uh, uh, the, for the others, you might, uh, you, know, we, you might come back or you might see um, a, a subsequent talk in the future. So when it comes to understanding, uh, it's probably no surprise that uh, a basic capability that we really want is to understand which pixels belong to what category, sky, ground, building, um, and foliage. And, and those are just obviously a, a few examples because depending on your situation, you might want a lot more. And, and I have to say, I really view this from the perspective of general uh, um, cross-domain uh, reality and, and scene understanding, not just from the perspective of games. So I felt I, I would really, really would like to see um, more of our technologies uh, used both in VR and AR, used for education um, and for uh, helping people um, with uh, disabilities or other special needs. So. Understanding the semantics of the scene is sort of a basic uh, uh, point, and, and I'm not going to dwell on it because uh, I think we, we all know that that's important, and there are always sort of steadily every day great innovations on that front, including at, at Niantic. Uh, instead, I'm probably going to focus on this one the most, which is the question of depth. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll play the first video. This is kind of in order of history. Here, what you're seeing is a, cam a phone with just a camera. There's no depth sensor. There's no walking around the scene and doing 3D reconstruction. It's just a camera standing, being held by in hand, and uh, the, the sort of laser spotlight is being shown uh, to, to, to show that the camera understands the depth of different points in the scene. And this is our mono depth capability um, that we had demonstrated oh, already 
in a way, three years ago, in theory, and we had uh, our, our research papers about this, um, but, but now uh, this capability has been maturing, getting better, uh, running more smoothly on the phone. Um, and so, uh, and so I am uh, excited to kind of show you the next chapter. Um, I see some some chat in the uh, in the I see some notes in the chat saying they don't see the video. Um, so I'm going to be very rudely turn around to, to, with my back to the audience uh, and play a, a video again. Um, it, is it showing now? Is that all right? See some users typing, giving me some feedback. That's great. No video. Nothing uh, yet. Yeah, I think they need to be on stage to see the, the video. Um, do you have a, a, a link, uh, Gabriel, that you can send them uh, through, through a chat? Yes, definitely. Um, so could I just post it here in the chat? The yeah, chat? yeah, you can. Yes, you can. And they will all right. Oh, video. dear. So, so uh, in fact, y y is anyone seeing my slides at all or, or uh, just the videos aren't playing? Just video isn't playing. Okay, and then I see a number of people who are uh, yeah. uh, also saying they cannot hear. They said there's no audio for me. Now I, I should point out there's no there's no audio in the videos. There's just uh, uh, I think I've muted them. But <laughs> if you can't hear me, raise your hand. That doesn't help. Um, <laughs> how can we debug the audio problem? Yeah, we will contact them through a private chat to help them. I see. I see. Okay. Um, well, a deep apologies for those who aren't. Uh, sorry for those who can't hear me. Um, so uh, I'll just type that message. Very sorry, it's such a small audience. I, I feel like, um, I mean, I, I am I am in the hands of our organizers, and they are they're adept at this, and they will no doubt uh, be able to fix this. My, from my personal perspective, if someone can't. If you can't hear me or you can't see the videos, feel free to come up on stage if that is the problem, if that solves the problem. Um, if you can't hear me or can't see videos. Um, so yeah. there's, there's plenty of space, you see. Um, all right. Um, all right, so I, I, I won't uh, uh, sort of um, delay any further. It sounds like uh, the technical problems are isolated to just some users. Is that is that right? So some of you can hear me, I think. I'm sitting on first row. Audio is fine for me. Can you send me a private? OK, so first row people seem to be able to hear. Uh, maybe even first row people can see the video. Uh -huh. bah, bah, bah. So frustrating. Um, well, I will just reshare. It's the same link. I, I am just pasting it again for anyone who missed uh, who missed it in the chat. Um, slides are fine. They can't see the video. Yeah, oh, there seems to be to, to be a limit, uh, Gabriel. Uh, when you click on the on the link and on the video, uh, I tried and I, I couldn't see the video as well. So I'm sorry. What is the issue? You, you, there's a limit to how many people can see. Yeah, at the same time. The video at the same time. That's what um, I, I got a message. Aha! Uh -huh. So this is a this is a Google. Are we seeing a Google Slides limitation? Nineteen total viewers. I'm seeing. Uh, uh, uh. Um, <laughs> so have you encountered, you haven't encountered this problem before? No. It's a new one. That's a new one. Um, so, uh, um, let's see, I'm going to make a copy of the presentation. Well, and that I, I way think there yeah. will be two versions of it. Yeah, well, I can download the, the video, so. There's that to, to solve the issue. You can download, but you, what are you going to do? Download each individual video. 
well, if that's the only way, I mean, for for them to be able to see. Okay. I don't know. Mm. Okay, so let's try this. Um, I'm I'm creating I cop got copy one of the presentation. So if you are on, on the original version, um, then uh, stay there. If you uh, can't see that one, try this. Is this is version two? Um, And then I will make uh, yet a, a copy of a copy. Um, third copy is here. So, um, and and in this way, uh, I hope that accommodates something like sixty people. Still the same problem in the copy version. Video won't play. So can I can I get an understanding? Is anyone able to see the videos play? Yes, I am. Okay, so some people are seeing them. Video in browser is running. Yep, yep, it's okay with your link. Okay. So I think the instruction, um, I think the instruction would be if you are uh, not able to, if you can see my the screen here in the virtual uh, uh, arena, great. If you can't see that, then please go to uh, the, the second or the third copy of the presentation. And uh, Google um, should allow, uh, it seemingly, uh, it looks like something around uh, 20 separate users uh, to watch, to see the slides um, in, the web, in their own web browser independently. Um, so as long as, uh, and if we get another 20 users, then uh, I can make a, a fourth copy. Um, Gosh, all right, so with, with all that delay, um, I hope it's okay, I'm gonna proceed. Hopefully everyone can hear me as well. Um, and, and now I, I suppose I will press on uh, despite the technical troubles. So what I was saying uh, was that we can, from a single camera, uh, estimate the depth of points in the scene, um, allowing us to create certain special effects um, and to create proxy geometry that we can then use for various purposes, whether it's occlusion or for collision, like you're seeing here. I hope you're seeing it. I'm playing the video in the middle, and so you should be seeing dice uh, uh, rolling around um, on on the slide uh, where um, uh, on this slide where we introduce the depth API, and. Um, then in, in the kind of uh, uh, ultimate version of, of using depth information, um, we, we have this understanding that we can share with our CG characters so that they can walk around um, and avoid obstacles or do sort of uh, basic behaviors to go around things when they bump into them. Um, and if they're trying to get someplace, they can wait for a little bit of help. Uh, although I have to say this is my favorite video because the, the human sort of gestures, uh, but it's a little bit of a trick, right? The, the character doesn't actually recognize gestures. We're not doing that yet, at least. Uh, it's just recognizing the space, uh, the empty space ahead of them. So, um, sorry, my back here. I'll turn around to face you. Uh, so, um, the the opportunities that we have from getting depth are are probably fairly clear now. Um, but how do we get that depth? So how was that technology uh, created? Yes, exactly. This is, thank you, this is a great question. Um, so we have this uh, technology based on our own uh, uh, solutions, but we are, of course, very keen to exploit existing technology. So uh, when we started this journey, uh, there was no uh, AR Core, AR Kit uh, uh, version of, of depth. Um, and 
uh, well, the fixed AI uh, it, it wasn't part of the videos you just watched, but uh, you will see in a moment uh, where fixed AI and uh, in particular Victor's uh, Victor Pizzicario's contribution uh, um, and and the other parts of the fixed team who joined Niantic uh, comes into play. It's a very important part of the story. So um, the the first uh, let's see I can use. Uh, not to not to take too much time here, um, but uh, oops. there we go. Uh, we can use the wonderful capabilities here. Um, so uh, oops, let me see. Oh, I can't reach that far. <laughs> um, there we go. Oh, oh, oh. That that didn't work very well. Um, trying to show you here, uh, but I think the laser capability isn't going to isn't working out very well for me. So I'll I'll stick with I'll stick with uh, describing what, what I'm pointing at in the in the slides. So the the monodrop neural network that you see in the middle there, this was the the version one and the version two. Something that we can train. Uh, it's a neural network that we can train from various types of signals, uh, lidar data if it's available. Uh, stereo data or video data, if that's available. But the point is that it's a neural network that takes a single RGB image as input and produces a single depth map as output. In this way, um, we are able to turn a, a regular phone, um, regular in quotes because it has to be able to run a neural network, uh, we're turn, able to turn a regular phone with a single camera into a depth sensing device. Um, it's recognizing depth rather than measuring it, rather than triangulating it. And uh, you might say, well, but my phone is very new, it has LIDAR, um, or you know, I'm, I'm able to uh, walk around with my phone, and I, I know about structure for motion, I can do sparse and then dense reconstruction. And these things are definitely true. Uh, and and you, should, you should do that if you can, right, if, you're, if your phone allows. The thing is, you're, you're always going to be limited to the range of that LIDAR, which is uh, about five, five and a half meters. Um, or you're going to be limited to have to walk around. You, you, your camera won't sense any depth until after you've started uh, walking around. And so this was kind of the case uh, um, for, for a long time. And then at CBPR uh, two weeks ago, we, we presented our, our newest work, so it's called the Many Depth Algorithm, uh, where we are taking kind of the best of both worlds. Um, and, uh, and indeed, this is where uh, the, the parts of the 6D team have, have been instrumental. So, uh, Victor is on this paper as well, um, as our other teams of the other members of the 6D team are behind the scenes because we, after joining Niantic uh, along with the rest of us, um, many depth is now available. It's available for download on GitHub as its as its own uh, live as its own code, so you can you can run it and use it. Um, uh, although we have some 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 license restrictions, uh, but certainly for research purposes, it's it's available and out there. Um, also, ManyDepth is part of the ARDK, this platform that I mentioned at the beginning, this, this light chip uh, that's available that uh, I'll, I'll tell you more about. It can be, you can sign up to be a beta user for it. So it's very exciting for us to have this research paper that is already uh, moved into production and in use in, in, in various parts uh, of Niantic and available for everybody's use. Um, so a little bit of behind the scenes of what's happening here, uh, this, this ManyDepth paper uh, and and the the code and the systems behind it uh, basically take the best of both worlds. In fact, the, the paper is called the temporal opportunist. Um, and so what happens is, if there is a history of frames, multiple frames, it takes advantage of those and and integrates them into uh, a, a kind of cost volume. So if you if you know uh, sort of multi-view stereo, then then you'll recognize that. But it is in the world of neural networks. So this is after a, a, an encoder has processed those images. And then there's a decoder for the cost volume as well. So we kind of get the best of both worlds in that we get a depth at frame zero before you've had any motion, before any ego motion has occurred, before it, it, we get instant depth like a light, light, LIDAR uh, sensor. And then the depth improves with time and space if you walk around, if you add some, introduce some baseline. Um, and also, unlike those libraries that require structure for motion, so, so some of the ones that were asked about in the chat, um, we also are modeling the depth of moving objects, cars, people, um, because we're doing this per frame and, and always computing a new depth, not relying on triangulation, not relying on 
of the scene staying static. Uh, and so this works on general phones that can run networks. Uh, uh, and so this is, this is pretty much all, all modern uh, cameras uh, can, can run this. And this means that suddenly your phone can speak that. Um, there are uh, some fun things you can do now. Uh, you can obviously take those steps per frame and merge them together, fuse them together into a 3D reconstruction of the scene. Um, for you know those who care about autonomous uh, driving, you know this kind of kitty video will look familiar. But the overall, uh, but but the overall point is that that we now have metric scale, um, and so we th these depths actually have meaningful measures. They can be used um, to do nice 3D reconstructions of of places, um, places and, and and people as well. But uh, kind of focusing here on places for the moment because we have a very uh, um, big user base of uh, really hardworking players of, of games who are interested in helping us to uh, expand the capabilities of the game. We want uh, the, the platform and our characters to understand the world around them. And that means that when they visit certain locations like a statue, they can and are actively filming um, and then uh, reconstructing, in fact, on the phone doing reconstructions of places, which then allows us to do uh, new kinds of um, uh, new kinds of uh, AR effects, um, such as let's see if we can uh, get the video playing. Oh, huh? Um, has been. Oh, let's see. The time number of allowed playbacks has been exceeded. Oh dear. Okay, so maybe maybe uh, uh, go using Google Slides was not a, a, a great move. Um, apologies. Uh, so <laughs> uh, da, da, let's see. I don't suppose giving you the, the link to the video directly is going to um, is going to make a difference, but I will try it anyway. Um, uh, so if you're here, you could try um, viewing it uh, directly. I suppose uh, as a, as a, as a viewer user, if if others have seen this video, then you know that's maybe why I can't show it on the on the big screen here. Um, but the, the thing you should be seeing is that uh, when we have mapped places, uh, we can return to those places and see augmented reality effects that people have left behind for us. Um, and then uh, this means we can interact with them. This means we can, the, 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 the CG elements persist. Um, and so it opens up, uh, I guess, a variety of possibilities in terms of uh, creative content. Um, I wanted to uh, point out one more piece of technology. I, I realize that uh, we're taking up a little too much time uh, through, through technical glitch, but um, I wanted to, to point out one other cool opportunity that um, we've been able to develop, which is not just estimating the visible, uh, the shape of the visible world, um, so that's estimating the depth ahead of us, but also to try to predict the shape of the world that's hidden. And in particular, the ground. Uh, and so, what you're seeing here is that we're um, in our footprints project. Um, it's also uh, a CUPR paper and also code online. Um, this is a system where we output not only the depth, but also this kind of hidden ground uh, geometry that you see on the bottom of the screen. So it's it's trying to show which parts of the scene are traversable by uh, people or CG characters. So that, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, right, so we have another video that won't, uh, won't play. A um, so little bit of a, uh, a shame there, uh, but what you would see there is a, uh, a video that plays and shows that the places where people are standing are labeled as occupied, and the space behind them is uh, estimated to be um, traversable and can be used by a CG character. So hopefully a version of that will be visible uh, here where 
instead of showing you kind of the direct output of the neural network, we're, we're just showing how a CG character can support this. So on the left side, we, the, the network has estimated just the depth. So this is, a, let's say, a typical uh, depth estimate. And the character can only walk on these parts of the ground that are, are visible. Um, but on the right side, because the footprint system has figured out that those people and, in fact, the, uh, the pushchair uh, in the middle are occupying a certain amount of space, but not infinitely into the scene. The space behind them where the penguin can walk and so it can pass behind objects. It can hide, it can peek out and things like that. Again, I invite you to uh, you know, access the, the code and use it for research purposes. We're very, very proud of this work and, and sort of the opportunities that, that it opens up. So to summarize, um, I think the, the maps of the future are uh, a great opportunity for bits to record their association to the real world atoms and uh, especially the observed ones. And this is a great, uh, I think, uh, uh, thing for all of us because uh, that way, whether you're an AR enthusiast or a VR practitioner, uh, you are able to interact with copies or, or, or pointers uh, to the real world that ex exists in the digital world. Um, we also are developing, uh, coming up, as you saw with footprints, mathematical uh, distributions to anticipate the unobserved parts of the scene. So we, we can make a guess of, of what's behind that, that person, what's the hidden part of the geometry, um, so that then uh, our CG characters and, and uh, um, pathfinding can take advantage of that. And then finally, obviously, we need semantic understanding so our CG characters can, can actually use the wor real world as a game board uh, and, and inhabit it. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel. At this point, I'm not sure if I uh, yield the floor or handle questions, um, uh, but I'm happy to do either. Yeah, I think, I think we need to do a yield the floor and I'll okay. change the speaker. Great, thank, thank you, you very much. So now, Erve, you can go. Okay, thanks, let me, let me come in. Um, morning, everyone. Let me just uh, get my presentation in. We're just checking, can you, is, is my presentation showing up now? Yes, yes, it's, can you, yes, it sounds that it's, it's okay. So first, uh, good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, many thanks to Laval uh, Virtual. Um, to uh, organize that conference, and uh, I think it's the second in also in in uh, virtual this time in a hybrid. Um, I want to share today is uh, what we're doing in order to scale VR in a, in a professional segment. So, um, as HTC, we've had a lot of uh, feedback from customers uh, through all the in initial trials, small scale events. Uh, and there's two big things that came that came to, from that. Um, the first thing is that what companies were looking for to scale VR was headsets that are designed for the reality of enterprise. And reality is that it's not a personal device. It's not like when you're a developer and you're spending your whole time with VR. You know, you know, in all details. In VR, in, in VR. In enterprise, fun, it's a shared device, which is dedicated to a single task. Many people use the same device. So it all has to be planned for. In a sense, what companies are looking for is to be able to use VR headset in the same way that they use other type of IT equipment in the companies that are not personal equipment. And uh, the second thing that came is really that uh, everyone was waiting for 
you know, big improvement into visual quality, but, you know, without, you know, bringing up the price too much. So it's kind of, you know, keep, keep the, the kind of price level that is, the, that enables you know, uh, to scale VR, but make it almost photorealistic, make it, you know, so keep clearly, uh, customers, you know, don't want to see the screen anymore. Don't want the screen, you know, those so-called screen door effects that were, that the industry, the word uses, uh, where you see the pixel. You know, every everyone was looking for having more photorealistic uh, view in VR. So we've we've taken those feedback on board and we've we've built the new products based on that. And that's what I want to to go in you know in details now. Um, so, you know, first a bit of an idea, you know, who are the customers, uh, it's, it's pretty widespread across uh, industries. So of course, automotive has, is, is massively using VR for, for a wide number of use cases, but architecture and construction coming up more, IO space, I think we're all familiar with, uh, and, and, and know that you know, companies are Boeing, Airbus, uh, and, and many others, you know, use VR more and more for the design. So, it, it is uh, it is spreading to uh, to many many more verticals now, and uh, if you look at it from a use case perspective, we've classified kind of six main VR use cases. So the the top row is uh, where you can see you know, either it's for really very precise simulation planning, like you know surgery or piloting or or it's for you know, design visualization, or it's, it comes to something like, you know, almost, you know, real life, like, you know, simulation, like uh, it's for, you know, for, for security purposes or firefighters or to, to train a, a complete, you know, cockpit crew in the same environment. So that, that is kind of an environment. Those, those three environments at the, I would say at the, you know, at the top row, um, they require quite a you know, high level of graphics, yeah? And the, those one, we address them to, to this uh, PCVR solution. And, um, and, and we'll see that we're making a big boost in, in uh, visual quality. In the, the bottom row, if you can see, uh, then this is about remote collaboration, training is massive as we all know. And, uh, and also what's coming up is in the marketing use cases like in store, you know, con kind of product configurator, car configurators. And, and this, is a, this is where mobility is essential. Here, you know, before anything, um, customer need that the, the device is a, a wireless, uh, sim uh, simple to use, um, and, and it's, it's mobile before anything. So what we've done is a, is really taking all the feedback about the, the, the mandatory use case that we need to adapt to and, and, and made to product that way. Um, what's specific to enterprise uh, is that uh, let's, take, let's take training. You know, if, if a company runs safety training on, on the VR, it's probably going to be in 20 minutes per session, one new trainee every 30 minutes. So you, you can easily have 10, 12, 15, you know, different uh, people who are going to use the same headset in the same way. And uh, of course that, that brings requirement on, you know, support of eyeglasses, uh, uh, you know, adapting to different shape of faces, adapting to the different distance between your eyes. So all, all sort of requirement that you would never have for your personal device getting out. Um, and, and also, this means that in, in this case, VR is used by people who don't know VR. Yeah? People are not, don't have any proximity with the, the technology at all. They just come for training. They come with a specific you know, purpose and objective in mind. Um, and if you look at the environment where it's used as well, it requires more robust product because it's been used in factories and construction sites. So, so places that are a lot more rough than what your home is. And, uh, and another very important point is that it, it must comply to a, the existing in IT security uh, that is in place. And, uh, and, and companies are really asking for, 
uh, the possibility just to completely, simply to, to integrate the use of BR into their normal existing processes. So, so we, we've taken that and we've uh, designed product for that. So there's, they, there's two things. And of course, you have a hardware part and a software part. But uh, on the PC VR side, we decided to, to build, to continue to build on the, the, the existing BIPRO that probably most of you already know. It's a very established product in the industry in particular because it's, uh, it's very well known to be uh, reliable. It works, basically. And, um, and it's, not, uh, it's not a tech, you know, kind of prototype-ish product. It's a product you can scale. But what we've done is to massively upgrade the visual part of it. And um, so, so the result is that you, you have a stable platform, but with uh, a 5K display. So it basically brings the, the resolution by 2.6 times higher than what it was before. We've brought also the possibility to increase the refresh rate in up to 120 frames per second and to have a very, very smooth uh, image. Um, we have brought a new type of display, which is based on LCD technology and which has uh, individual red, green, blue subpixel for each pixel. And we've, we have brought also new lenses to be able to increase further the field of view to 120 degrees. So as you can see, there is no, there is no equivalent in the, uh, in the industry. Uh, you know, while we, were, we stayed, you know, we kept the product in the same kind of price range that what they, the, the Vipro is. So that means really very scalable. It is, uh, we wanted that in any way, what, whatever configuration it be, you know, below $2,000. And uh, so just to go a little bit more in, you see where the Vipro is, the Vipro is, is much more, you know, much better in terms of resolution than any competitor. And, uh, and of course, you, you, you can imagine all the application in architecture, in training, look at, you know, the impact here the, on, the, on an example of a plane cockpit. So what it means that you can really, you know, define text without having to zoom or lean so you can have a very realistic training. But you can project yourself into the same for, you know, healthcare training, for example, to be able to read, you know, fine text on simulated, uh, uh, medical equipment for, for, for monitoring the health. And uh, what we've done on the, um, on, on the field of view side is to change the, the lens. So we've designed a new generation of, of lenses that is, uses a two element. So we call it dual element. And in order to be able to enhance the field of view to 120 degrees. So if you if you add the, to this, you know, which are the physical element of, of visibility to the type of display we've put in, um, this also enables the possibility to have a much more accurate version of colors. So we, we do cover almost 99% of the so-called sRGB color uh, gamut. Um, this will echo to designers, to uh, architects, really to, to uh, all those people who use you know, 3D all day long and who need to try to reproduce reality as close as possible to make decisions with reality, with a simulated reality. So whether it's with a, you know, by themselves with their teams or whether it's uh, um, you know, for, together with their customer like an architect. And uh, having done this, having created a platform which, uh, which, which is a top class quality of visualization still affordable, what we've done is to, 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 to take it, keep it into a, a standalone format and we have redesigned completely from scratch a standalone handset that can combine both this premium visualization quality and everything that enterprise expect for uh, the actually you know, a standalone headset. So that's the, the Vive Focus 3. The Vive Focus 3 is very, very new. You probably have, haven't seen a 
seen it yet is uh, we just started to uh, ship to uh, the first customers last week so it's fairly new but it's it's ticked all the boxes that uh, that we we wanted in order to be able to enable companies to scale what we we've learned is that you know, if you're a large company and you you want to scale your training if there are a number of people that are involved and we need to make sure that we provide all the elements to all of them. You can't pick and choose. So it's it both for the, the business owner, you know, that we call here the digital experience leader, both, you know, people are actually doing, you know, using VR on, a, on, on an everyday basis. So for example, the, 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 the training teams and also the, the IT team that uh, do make it happen. And uh, make sure that it, it's uh, it's reliable. It's uh, they, the the content is regular is regularly updated. It's stack confidential. So we we make sure we can tick all the boxes. So as you can see here from the visual perspective, we've taken over exactly the same screen, exactly the same lenses. We just need to adapt slightly the refresh rate because the the power we have into a mobile in a processor is obviously a lot uh, less than what we have in a PC. And uh, we can, we, we cap it to 90 frames per second, but 90 FPS already, you know, enables to make sure that there is a very, very few people who will sense any motion sickness. And that was really important for us to make sure we can, we can take that. And in our software, we, we do, you know, put priority on the frame per second. Um, in a, when you compare the Vive Focus 3 then with other standalone headsets, then the difference is, is massive. As you can see here, uh, it provides a much better resolution than the, the, in any of the, the competition. But uh, also what you can clearly see there, there is a, a higher focus on, on the horizontal part. So it is to make sure that we can provide both the 120 you know, degree field of view together with that, uh, that, that uh, high resolution. Um, in a field of view is is a uh, illustrated here. You probably when you you've used a number of VR headset, you know, typically at some time you felt it's black on the side. Sometimes you you feel a little bit in the tunnel and so. On. And this not might not be a problem for for gaming because you focus on the action in the middle. But if you are doing safety training and that you really want to to simulate, you know, when, when risk comes, comes, you know, risk usually do, doesn't come in front of you. You have, it comes from the periphery, it comes from where you don't expect it. So having 100 degree field of view makes a real difference into the realism of the, the simulation. In order to be able to drive this with a, with a, with a limited, you know, power, of, of, uh, of processing. So we've had to make sure that we can pull the, the processor very well in order to be able to always you know, use the maximum of the power and also that we can, we can use it in a continuous way that uh, a training team, for example, can run you know, 10 hours of, of training with in continuously. So we, we've, we've made a unique design uh, where we both have internal cooling with both active cooling with the fan, but we also have a, what is called a heat pipe to, to, a, to be able to evacuate 15 watts. And uh, we've kept, we, we have built all that into a very, very robust um, if, you say framework, which is a, made of magnesium alloy. So again, there you see we've, you know, building such a, a frame um, it was uh, also driven by the, you know, we know that uh, using VR in an enterprise is, is a bit of a more rough environment that uh, at home where you can take care of your product nicely. Another uh, thing that we face more in, a, in, in as software here is the, the, the specific feature to enable a developer to put the priority on the fine text, for example, that needs to, to be always, you know, displayed the best, you know, eventually at the expense of other parts that, uh, that are less important in the picture. So this is a, something that, you know, feedback that we got in quite a number of, uh, of, of times, a number of scenarios from training that uh, often 
you know, reading text is actually the most uh, the most uh, challenging in in standalone VR because you you want to have an accurate simulation. You you want to make sure that the text is also simulated uh, at the normal you know size and it's not being just made bigger just because of the art because then it's not it's not realistic and that's a so, so we're providing that technique in order to be able to to use the to focus the the processing power to the text that you want to uh, to 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 prioritize um another thing is is a for the interaction so we've built a hand controller in order to make sure that they're well balanced in terms of weight and um in order to be able to facilitate longer sessions, for example. In collaboration, you can have you know, sessions that come for you know, more than an hour. Um, they're built on the industry standard key mapping now, and they have a rechargeable battery that lasts the whole day, you know, even more 15 hours uh, in a runtime. So it's built for continuous operation so that the team can you know, charge them during the night and then they can last the whole day. One, one, I'm sure, one thing I'm sure everybody is familiar with is the requirement for hygiene and clean. It's, uh, it's obvious with the, the pandemic that uh, we need to, to provide solutions that are safe um, and that are easy to manage. So there's two things we do here. Um, one is that we use material that you can clean with alcohol. You know, of course, you can also clean them with uh, UVC um, uh, equipment if you have some. But uh, you know, in a simple way, you can use them with clean them with alcohol, seventy percent. And then the other thing is that we we have made sure that the, the both the front face mask and the real padding, so anything that touches the face, um, is very easily removable. They're simply attached by magnets, so they just uh, you you remove them in half of a second. Uh, and if you if you have to run. Uh, an operation with high throughput of, of people, then you know, simply between people, you you just uh, re, you know remove uh, the you know the through the magnet. You just uh, take out the the one the, the face masks and the padding that have just been used, and uh, you know put replacement one that you have used, and in, in a between two users, you can clean that have just been used. So it's uh, it's really made whether it's for location based entertainment or for you know high throughput training, it, it's uh, it's really made to be able to keep hygiene while uh, enabling um, uh, you know many people to use one after the other. The one of the other items that you, you might have experienced in the past with with many devices you'll see that the weight is front loaded, and if you have an experience over 20 minutes many people will feel that they're a little bit you know tired there uh, and uh, and some some people will interrupt their their experience so to prevent that we've built a product that is you know extremely well balanced so the it's uh, it's accurately you know 50 percent of the weight on the back with the battery and 50 percent in the front so it is very very comfortable As we've seen, you, we probably have a bit different statistics, you know, depending on, on the country, but roughly over 60% of, of people working in company wear eyeglasses. And they, they feel very uncomfortable. They have to remove their glasses for something like, like VR. So we've made sure that uh, you can keep your glasses and we've made sure that you can adapt to, you know, and adjust the distance between your eyes uh, in a, with a very wide range. And in a very easy way, you don't need to touch anything. You just have a you know small dial to turn, uh, and then they, when you turn that dial, it basically you know display a pattern. Uh, we that and we by turning you adjust that pattern when it when you 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 can see the best, then that's it. So it, it's a little bit if you have used the, one of the you know, the older you know cameras in the Pass where you had to stem, so we've we used that, and it's it's very easy. It's um, it is also intuitive. Um, from the audio perspective, what you'll notice when you use the Vive Focus Three is that it has a fantastic audio, uh, very rich, 
but also what you've noticed is that uh, we we have included uh, um, technology so that we focus the user towards the inside, and then, and then you actually have a, a big attenuation toward, toward the outside. So what we wanted to make sure is that you know when you have you know five ten people in a room that is doing a simulation training for example, as a group, or when it's LED equipment for example, make sure that. Uh, your audio does not disturb the people next to you. And that's very unique, that's very, that's very new. Um, so I, as, as, as you can see, we designed the BioFocus 3 to be able to be that product that enterprise can scale. It's, um, it's, it's built for LED, it's built for, for hygiene, it's, it's, it has a, an extendable battery in the back, so you can, you can within your two, three seconds, remove the battery and put a new one. So, so that, you know, you, with a two hour battery in a lifetime, you basically need two to three batteries and you just uh, run the whole day with it. So it's really built for heavy duty. And um, we, we think that this way will enable, you know, a lot of teams to be able to, uh, scale you know really at, at you know widely vr within the, the the company one specific feature we've built in is not for everyone but if you know the the application you're running you know, is too heavy to be able to be run by the headset itself then you can stream vr you can stream vr both from a pc from a you know cloud server or you you can uh, you can streaming also i would say both with the cable USB-C or over Wi-Fi. We support Wi-Fi 6. Now, that's about the hardware. When you come to the software, we've built a very straightforward interface that uh, most of the time in, in, in a company is marked. So, and you, you have different modes. One is you know, effectively with the launcher where you can display the app that, that you choose. Uh, the other one is also kiosk mode, where you don't want to display anything. You want the headset to launch a single app directly and to, and to make sure that the user cannot go out of that uh, app, and that's called uh, the kiosk mode. Uh, the kiosk mode is included in the Viafocus 3. It doesn't require any additional you know, cost or any additional subscription. It's, it's included and can be deployed by, by any... Um, on, on, on any of the, the focus uh, right out of the box. Um, now, having you know, seen a lot of the uh, interaction on the on LinkedIn, you know, you can see deployment, software deployment, and hardware deployment is often a big difficulty. So, we really wanted to come up with a solution that are simple in a sense that that are commonly used by companies when, when they're deploying uh, IT equipment. So we've come up with three possibility to deploy. I'm sorry, sorry, uh, Harvey, to interrupt you, but uh, the next speaker, uh, I need to start now. Yeah, okay, so let me, then let me quickly finish, so. Yeah, we'll, thank we'll you very much. See, so you'll be able to, you know, to have detail there from batch configurations to a to you know simple mobile device management or support of you know usual market device management, and uh, I'll be very happy to uh, answer any question on that and then and and to to point you out to a um, to, to to the right place to get detailed information on uh, on device management and deployment. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I wish you a great uh, day at Laval Virtual.
Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so I'm gonna start now. Just give me a second. Okay, so hello, my name is Mauricio Aracena, and together with Tom DeConnick, we're going to present uh, our, uh, this presentation about volumetric streaming over 5G. We're both uh, part of the VR, Virtual Reality Industry Forum. I'm the president, and Tom DeConnick is the communication chair for the VRIF. So VRIF, it's a uh, non-profit organization with the sole purpose of to further the widespread availability of high quality of the visual VR experiences for the benefit of consumer. We, well, it was founded almost five years ago in CES 2017. And since then we started to work from VR, uh, virtual reality 360. And now we are more expanding the scope to the more volumetric and AR and also including the 5G aspect, how to deal with better uh, quality uh, of delivery over uh, streaming. So who we are, uh, these are the current membership that we have. Uh, when some have Van Hofer, I was hoping that Van Hofer will have an introduction of the production aspect, so I could go easy on, on talking about volumetric streaming, but I will try to do my best to explain. And just want to mention that VRIF scope is divided now in four tracks. As I said, mentioned before, VRC60 was the main goal now, but now we just divide the scope in four tracks. One is volumetric, the one I'm going to talk about now, social VR, which is something that we are all experiencing right now with this uh, platform. And the 5G cloud, which is an uh, important aspect that can help to the adoption of better quality on VR AR services. So today I'm going to talk about volumetric and 5G cloud together. So first of all, what's about, about volumetric use cases? So first of all, you capture the uh, uh, volumetric asset, let's say a person with a camera array around you, and then you create an asset that can be rendered into a 2D display or AR glasses or even a VR 360 uh, headset. And the idea is that, uh, but that you enable a lot of tools, both for production, but also how to enhance the experience of the user. For instance, the, to the topic that today is how to deliver this volumetric asset. And basically you can see the arrow here where you have boxer that's been captured live uh, from a boxing stage here. Uh, and that's basically something that you can combine with a second screen deliver of uh, AR experiences. So you're watching the big TV together and at the same time wearing your AR glasses, you can watch closer from any point of view, 60 degree of freedom, the boxes are fighting in front of your table. There are also other aspects of volumetric capture and use cases like uh, live sport personal view. Basically you have an array of cameras around the stadium and you can regenerate it any point of view within the, the stadium the, uh, artificially. That's a very interesting part. And also you can uh, have a social VR and create a reality av avatar representation, realistic avatar representation of yourself by having, for instance, this platform in that way. So today, mainly focusing volumetric streaming of uh, volumetric assets. This is basically what we're doing in VRIF. We're working on a guidelines uh, release for the end of the year, which we consider everything about from end-to-end -end volumetric streaming. So you can see that it's divided in three steps, the volumetric content provider into the, to the left, in the center, the volumetric content, uh, content uh, delivery, and then volumetric service platform. So from the production aspect, you have a camera array and you capture different cameras, and from that you generate a 3D point cloud representation of one user. And for that, you can create, uh, let's say, uh, different parts for production, for a movie, for instance, that you can uh, play with that in a 2D representation by suddenly in the moment you have a person moving around and then you, you can switch the view easily. So it's an answer user experience even in a film. But also you can create volumetric asset from a, that can enhance the 2D content. You can put it on the 3D, 360 video content or 3D overlays that you can deal with the, the, any type of use case. This is more for production. 
and post-production that can help you to, to enhance your quality of experience. Although, what's important today is how you actually you deliver or uh, a volumetric asset to, to the end user. This is the main challenge that you have today about. So, as you can see here, uh, you have two ways to deliver a, a volumetric asset. And we're talking about one person, one user, one object. One is through point cloud compression, streaming, and the other one is mesh uh, streaming. Today, I'm going to mainly talk about point cloud compression and coding, as this is current work we are doing in BRIF, although we are soon going to look at mesh and coding too, so to, to address how it actually happened. So how have they actually done this one today? Uh, the, the interesting thing that is already a standard in MPEG, which is called MPEG B3, B, Video Point Cloud Base, and it's reducing actually a 2D video codec. So what's actually happened here that you have a 3D asset with the point, and then you 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 project those in three sort of uh, type of uh, 2D video encodings, and you reduce the current availability of video encodes that you have already in the market, for instance, and right now, uh, the main focus on BRI is to use HEVC. And this is one of the profiles that is, belongs to the MPEG standard. And from that, you, you encode uh, these uh, three projections from uh, 3D asset, and then you deliver as a standard 2D video. One, and then you use a streaming protocol, for instance, that streaming, and, and then at the device, you take uh, the, three, the, rec, uh, the three parts of the volumetric access and you reconstruct by decoding each of them and generate it in the, the GPU, the final volumetric uh, representation of yourself. And so basically what you can do this is today with the current uh, devices that you have, for instance, the mobile phones, which are the most widespread uh, sort of player device, you can watch your uh, volumetric asset in a flat screen. Basically you, you see around you and you can go around with the phone or you can use in the more advanced use case and more comfortable is having an AR glasses. You can still do that in the same way. Or if you want to be fully immersed, you can also use that volumetric asset in a VR uh, HMD. So this is basically the volumetric streaming end to end. And this is how you can do it today using a standard MPEG uh, codec. However, there are a lot of challenges with regards to, to deliver this one. You, the, the sole uh, example here using a to the video coding uh, using a convert using volumetric streaming over a regular to the video decoding produce some load in the device and also still it's kind of a lot of bitrate and especially if you want to deliver several uh, volumetric assets you need to do one each encoding for each of them so that you can to send three person you need to send a three separate persons in order to to see them all of them in, in the device. And that's posed a lot of challenge uh, in the long run if you want to have better quality. So that's what comes 5G. And important to mention that 5G uh, is not only about radio, it's also about cloud XR concept that we call it. So it's a, actually a cloud infrastructure uh, that's uh, and embedded in the 5G. And that has two important aspects. One is that the, the you, you have a central server and you have an edge server and that's tightly connected with the radio or, or the 5G. And the advantage of 5G is that you normally have uh, quite uh, high bandwidth downlink and, then, and very low latency uplink, which is quite interesting when it comes to request uh, what you want to see in real time. It's particularly important, for instance, for cloud gaming. Uh, it will be announced a lot uh, using uh, 5G for particular cases like you want to use your mobile phone. And at the same time, and more important, is that doing everything in the cloud will allow you to, to save battery time. So you basically, what's happening in the device to the right, whatever type of device that's connected via 5G, is that uh, you only render video to the video. So this is basically what I show here. So when it's come to volumetric streaming over 5G, uh, you have the volumetric asset into the left here, and it's uh, capture and process, uh, let's let's assume this is only VOD, post-production only, but you also could have it uh, real time from a live event. And then given how you see the, which point of view you are seeing from the, the your screen or your eyes is watching that, you send this tracking information and system information to the edge server, which is quite quick using 5G. And then in the edge server, the application, the server application will 
uh, render what you should see. Uh, basically, the viewport that you want to see from this, the, the, the volumetric asset. And then that will be a projection of that, uh, a 2D projection of the volumetric uh, asset into, and then we'll be sending code to a 2D video code, a standard 2D video code. And then you send it to the device, and then you decode it as 2D video. So what's the advantage of using 5G Cloud XR concept is that basically all the devices in the future will become just standard regular player, and all the logic and all the updates and upgrades of the services will happen in the in the server. So what's the point important here with, with this sort of uh, use case that there's not really much processing in, in the device, and uh, only you need to have a good connectivity, a good, uh, let's say, 2D video decoding, and of course have a 5G connection and a service that run over this architecture that at the end, uh, you will have very long lasting uh, battery lifetime because basically you 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 don't you just play video as a normal Netflix. And then I'm going to give them to the contract to my colleague uh, Tom. Yes, uh, thank you, Mauricio, um, and um, thank you a lot on 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 this uh, uh, interesting way of of. Um, making sure that volumetric video is transported up to the user. And, and of course, it is all on the technical side. It is described and it is possible and so on. But what we see always is uh, important in this way of working that um, interoperability is assured, um, not only on the volumetric video, but we also saw that on uh, VR360. We will also see that on, on social VR and 5G cloud, and that's why VRAF is working um, very much on, on standardization and guidelines, not so much on standardization, that's for bodies like MPEG, but especially on guidelines for implementation of these standards. How exactly uh, can you implement these, what to use, what which profile specifically also what to use um, when looking at the standards. Um, and this is what we did, we have a, a, a clear uh, past of guidelines already uh, published uh, in, in they are freely available on our uh, on our website and also a roadmap of course on, on guidelines to be published in the future um, and looking at at VRIF what we did so um, apart from these guidelines of course it is important also to show um, like audience like this um, to evangelize uh, also the work we do um, and we're trying to be as present as possible on um, on multiple events um, to show what we are doing and, and to take some bits and pieces out of it and, and to get an interest from, uh, from the audiences on what we are doing. Secondly, um, important also is to test, to test what we um, put on paper, that it's also feasible, that it's also um, exactly what the market is looking for. And for instance, last year we did uh, some tests with the Streaming Video Alliance. Not so much yet uh, uh, on streaming of volumetric video, but still on 360 VR. Um, but it was showing exactly also on real life, real uh, deployments, what are the challenges, what needs to be done, and so on, to make sure that market picks up um, much faster implementation of end-to-end -end, uh, services. Uh, so lastly, um, if everyone is anyone is interested uh, in our work and wants to join in exactly uh, what we are doing, please go to our uh, website or uh, contact either uh, Mauricio or myself. Um, we are uh, a non-profit organization so relying exactly on the work of our members, of our member companies, and, and exactly on the people working for these companies um, to, uh, to uh, do the work and, and to make sure that we are uh, going further and we are uh, advancing VR and XR and as a whole um, for the whole community. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, after this, there's still a panel where I will also be uh, giving some more views on, on VR and XR. Thank you very much.
Oh, euh, du coup, vous voulez que je mette les slides euh, Oui, bah, Jean-Philippe, si vous en avez pour le panel. Non, c'est pas bon. Ah oui, si c'est bon. Bonjour à tous, je vous invite à prendre place et puis hop, je me pousse et, et puis on va pouvoir enchaîner. Je vous remercie tous pour vos présentations. Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien, tous Oui, très bien. Oui, merci. Top. Et puis, eh bien, je ne sais pas. Si on démarre maintenant ou si on y a une petite pause entre euh, au niveau des organisateurs. Jean-Philippe, je ne sais pas si tout le monde a entendu. Sorry. Oui, oui, oui. We are going to start in a few minutes. Uh, do, do you, everybody, uh, uh, is the mic working? Sound check, one, two. Okay, perfect. One, one two, two, check, check. Can you hear me? Perfect. And, and this is Tom. Can you hear me? Yes. So, uh, I don't know, do, do, do we start now uh, or is there a break yeah. of uh, five minutes? No, we start not you, now. You can start now, you clip if you want. Perfect. Okay, so uh, thank you for everyone. Um, we are starting, um, we, we are finishing the way for. Oh. We are finishing this journey uh, with a panel uh, of speakers to talk and to sum up what's next uh, in, uh, in uh, alternate realities. We can, we can call that uh, alternate realities, mixed realities, virtual realities, whatever. And um, to solve that, I have a few questions uh, we can discuss and have your point of view from your perspective and your work. First, uh, we all are in fact with the pandemic. So I, I would like to say uh, how the pandemic impacts your work. Uh, does it, is it faster? Is it um, trigger new opportunities? Uh, what do you, how do you see the, the pandemic uh, for alternate realities? Uh, if someone wants to start. Maybe Tom? Yes, um, thank you. Um, it and, and, and maybe briefly, so I'm working for TNO, it's a Dutch research institute, and uh, we've been working a lot on, on social VR. And this is, a, of course, exactly something that comes in very useful uh, during this pandemic. Uh, people are stuck at home, stuck uh, at um, locations, cannot uh, see each other together. And uh, social VR um, is, is, of course, a means to uh, again get together what we saw is of course for our work it became much more difficult we we used to go in in our lab and to do tests uh, to have users in uh, to do um, uh, tests with, with with users it was much more difficult to do the physical work on the other hand there was much more interest from the market from a very large market now on how exactly can social VR be used? Um, for instance, we had very much interest also from uh, um, uh, elderly care homes. 
how can all the people get in contact again with their family? Is that just by phone and by, by Zoom? Or are there more immersive ways of doing that? And, and so testing indeed these with people not used at all to use VR um, to get, get an immersive um, uh, experience seeing their family members again. So on one hand, it was much more difficult to do stuff. On the other hand, there was much more interest to get things done. Um, so it was um, for, for, for us as an organization uh, a challenge, but also fun because there was much more interest there. Uh, so basically that's, that's what we experienced. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, what about you, Gabriel? Uh, how has uh, the pandemic impact uh, your business? I would say I, I have to agree with Tom. I, I think uh, maybe we observed a, a similar uh, situation. I, I would say, speaking for the R and D team, um, we were we were not really prepared uh, for this. We, uh, the company Niantic, is very uh, kind of founded on the idea of of maps and going outside, exploring with friends. Um, in, in big groups, you know, outdoors, and uh, and suddenly we were told to stay at home, and and so a lot of the use cases that we really that drove a lot of our innovation um, were, were sort of parked for a while to think more about uh, either either life at home or life when you are out on your own, uh, uh, trying to keep your distance from everybody. So so from the re research side and and the development side. It, it caused a lot of uh, uh, changes in our thinking in, in terms of how can we support people to, to get outside, be alone maybe, or, or just with their immediate family, and, and then take some of that, that fun back home with them. Um, and, and, and so on the, on the other side, as, as Tom said, for, for us, we found that a lot of the, the users of, of the Niantic products, the games, uh, really turned to this technology uh, in mass to, to for entertainment for a little bit of a, a variety, um, and so I would say, yeah, it's a great it's a great opportunity and it's a great challenge that that now we all have to think about and, and rise to is how to uh, uh, connect sort of the <laughs> freedom of outdoors even if you physically can't go there sometimes. Okay, thank you. And uh, what about you, Hervé? I, I assume that uh, at HTC, there's lots of opportunities. Yeah, I mean, in the end, price you s it also depend very much on the on, on uh, the sector. But while you, I think, generally speaking, it has accelerated. You know, the the fact that companies you know try in in VR for or, you know, more use case that they were doing it, you know, until now. But things we've seen, for example, in the car industry, um, the, some of the large car manufacturer design team have actually sent their workstation to the home of, of their team so that they can continue to work from there and do product review in VR um, while being remote. Yeah. So, so that's, that's a... And, and definitely that would not have happened without the, the pandemic, without people being you know, obliged to, to, to work from home. Um, on the other side, on the training side, you would say, uh, you know, usually VR training happens in dedicated room today in, in most companies. So those rooms were closed, yeah. the people couldn't come. So that, that's, you know, we've seen a number of projects in airlines and that had to simply close their training centers. So that 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 was the negative aspect, um, and uh, I say another you know positive trend is the number of companies that have started to to try VR collaboration. So it's you know it, now it I would say before pandemic you had only kind of you know teams or or you know a kind of a VR collaboration platform for small POCs. Uh, and the big change during the pandemic is that, uh, number one, all those VR collaboration have made sure they can provide a, also a, a 2D you know, version that you can also basically connect to, to the meetings in a, with, a, with a 2D screen, PC screen, or, so that you, you, have a, you don't absolutely need to have a, a VR headset to, a, to connect to a 3D world. 
it's 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 uh, almost all platforms and the second that you know clearly there, there is quite a number of um, mostly large corporate that uh, um, have uh, equipped a few teams to uh, you know test VR collaboration in real life so it's step one so we are i wouldn't say we've seen companies deploying thousands you know it's you're more in the teams of you know 10 here 20 here and uh, but it it seems to be a, a clear trend something that will have accelerated that uh, market ad adoption okay thank you so there's uh, many opportunities for customers to try and uh, it's uh, it's good uh, options to um, to organize better, more device, more access for people who can't go to uh, already their rooms. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and you, uh, you can see one of the learning, sorry to interrupt you, you know, uh, uh, learning we've taken the, the for, to support the work from home uh, setup. Uh, that's the reason why we've uh, included VPN support in the new product. And I think it's probably the only product in the market, but. But it's becoming very important now, it, you know, and it, it wasn't in the past. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. You, you have to, to provide the security and all the things that a uh, company uh, requires to work remotely. I understand. And uh, what about you, uh, Sven? How uh, does the COVID uh, impact uh, your business? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, I have to say the, the pandemic came about a year too early <laughs> for us uh, because we, we were already in the process of doing. Um, Captures. I mean, um, just just a bit of explanation. So I'm running a volumetric capture studio in Germany, and uh, with with the technology, we are able to capture humans photorealistically for three D environments. And uh, with those cases, we 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 did a lot of uh, captures for training and uh, remote work, so that you basically can have uh, a professional captured in our studio, and then you can watch them in virtual reality or mixed reality directly on different locations and easily uh, yeah, expand those training scenarios. And when, when the pandemic basically came, we were already in the process of doing those captures, but all those projects were canceled immediately. So we got like 90% of the projects which we had during this time uh, were completely canceled because uh, with the beginning, nobody really knew what, what, what would happen next basically. Um, but on the other hand, everyone was very much more focusing on the whole part, how to make things happen more easily remotely. And I think uh, that there was, a, uh, I mean, it was a huge challenge, but on the other hand, also it gave a lot of opportunities and also provides more, uh, more, more, more ground for future technologies now to build up on, on um, for, for future basis, because uh, due, due to the pandemic, a lot of companies now have learned how important it is to provide those remote accessibilities and to promote, provide a remote training. And now we see uh, since the pandemic is, yeah, Get getting at least uh, from the feeling to, to an end. Uh, we, we now have a lot of companies re requesting for more precise uh, projects. So they now have used this whole time to really look into how they can be more digitized for the future, how they can do uh, workshops remotely, what kind of new headsets coming out, and how they can incorporate all these new technologies in their production pipelines. So they got a bit of, I would say, time to focus on new technologies. And in the end, or in the long run, I think this will help every one of us quite dramatically because we're now talking to way more educated clients which have much more focus on what kind of products they want to apply for their future and i think this will help, help us a lot and we see it now since the last weeks we now have a lot of uh, project requests more than one project request per day basically coming in now in our studio and during the pandemic it was really nearly nearly to zero which was quite yeah uh, quite impressive to see this <laughs> this is big uh, yeah Going going down in the numbers, but I think in the long run it will um, will have a big uh, important um, yeah yeah step into, into the development of all the systems right now. And also for us. Ah uh, yes, ninety uh, percent is very hard <laughs> in this uh, in this time. I understand. I yeah. know that there's lots of uh, company that uh, that uh, had a project of uh, VR and they they use. Uh, the pandemic to to use it, but obviously uh, you have to think, have things prepared in order to be able to to move on. And uh, it, like you said, it's everything about timing. Yeah, but, we uh, just yes. had a small thing. We we also had to change some of our uh, business directions a bit due to the pandemic. I think a lot of companies did it. Um, so before we we worked quite quite a lot in terms of this remote training. 
planning scenarios and also uh, for events and venues to do captures there. Um, but due to the pandemic, we switched over a lot for feature film productions to provide our services for yeah, very huge feature films where, where we use volumetric captures for yeah, movie productions, basically for the final screen and not, not just for mixed reality headsets. And um, yeah, we because those productions kept running, they, they didn't close down and we have them directly on our location. So I think a lot of companies, at least if I heard, have all altered their, uh, their business models during the pandemic quite a bit. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about the hardware and um, let's talk about the future of VR. Uh, let, let's say that the pandemic is behind us, I hope. And uh, what do you think of uh, now people learn more about VR because they try project, they, they get, uh, um, get sensible about all this subject. Uh, what do you think about the future of the, the hardware and what will come in in the next year, let's say. Let's start with RV. I know you introduced already a, a new yeah. headset. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think we, we have to recognize we've, we're still in the early phase of, um, of uh, immersive visualization. So if you project yourself in the next you know, short term, you know, one, two years, um, what you can say, we, we, st we st still going to be, you know, with products that are based on display, like, like the, the, the new Vive Focus 3 or what the Quest 2 is. Or, so products that are based on display with lenses. Um, and the, the main improvement that we're, we're bringing is the quality of visualization and ease of use. Yeah, that combination. So... So it, you know, it means, and, and the reason why we focused on enterprise on our side is, a, is, is you know, is because there, um, there was there was a major, you say, major hole to fill. It was not possible to scale. It was not, you know, for an enterprise. It was a nice product for innovation department, but it was it wasn't really possible to, to put into practice at scale. So we wanted to solve that. Now, if you project yourself a bit further, you know, clearly what's uh, one of the, the, the trend in the new family of product will be what you could call the viewer. Yeah? Like, you know, the, um, the Ericsson team was mentioning their work on, on streaming over 5G. Clearly, you know, once the 5G network rolls out, the edge computers also rolls out more than it you know, it's, it becomes possible to rely on viewer and to do the rendering in those edge um, edge server. Uh, but uh, I say it's the beginning because it's it's really just just starting. You know, the the first commercial service offering has opened, uh, I think, two months ago. I mean, to, on on AWS and Azure is coming, so it takes some time to roll out. But if you project yourself, is definitely you know one uh, direction, and that will allow small and lighter product, which are basically viewers, and some will be connected simply to your 5G smartphone, for example. Yeah, the, the chip, some will, some will have completely 5G integrated, but some will simply rely on, on your 5G smartphone and, and will, be, uh, will be cheaper. And how do you, you see the, the future uh, of the hardware in regards of, um, how I would say that, uh, how uh, the content we want to display. Do you think um, we will still be with a headset? We, we, do we move to something lighter like glasses or holograms? Uh, in regards of, uh, I would say, content like uh, we talk about vol volumetric capture, um, we always want to display a lot of content that is heavy. So are we moving more to, I would say, light headsets uh, with light content to, to, to talk to more and more people or more specific industry and uh, uh, technical headsets to, to work to B2B. I don't know if I'm clear. Yes, do you? Uh, I, I, I tend to say both. Are we moving to, to lighter, you know, product? Yeah, I mean, the it is required, it is what everybody would like, is it what all the industry is trying to achieve? So it just takes a number of iterations to, to, to do that. 
um, because all technologies are not available yet. But, but yes, in the end, it will happen. Um, I think you you mentioning also you know holograms and uh, this is something that we you know we all would like telepresence yeah, and to be able to to look in front of us and to have some some remote uh, you know family members or colleagues uh, you know in that same room where we are and you know interacting as if uh, they were here. So, um, but where with what mix of technology will that happen? Uh, you know, I believe that uh, depending on your situation, you have different technology available. Uh, something that relies on glasses will stay mainstream because it's, it, it will make it um, possible at affordable cost. Whereas in some, um, when you equip rooms, you, you know, you'll be able to have um, more, you know, hologram projected in a sense, but that's, uh, there is uh, the cost behind it. And that that is uh, not likely to be able to be accessible to individual users in the short term. Okay, and uh, so, so uh, for instance, uh, Gabriel, do, do you have uh, in mind uh, some target devices uh, for Niantic? Are you still on on the mobile phone, or do you think in the future about other kind of hardware? Uh, uh, like headset, glasses, or things like that. Uh, do you have a strategy behind that? Uh, yes, we we are definitely thinking about these, and so uh, mobile mobile is here to stay. But uh, but these opportunities are, are obviously uh, exciting, and so we've been um, I guess uh, collaborating in a, in a in a, a small to a small extent uh, with Microsoft and Hololens. Um, but also with Qualcomm about uh, the idea of headsets in general. So, uh, especially uh, you know, Qualcomm and, and at that level, because we we really look forward to a world where um, headsets are quite inexpensive and very lightweight, um, and where there will be opportunities uh, to kind of function normally in your day, uh, just like I'm wearing glasses now. But but with the opportunity to to have this extra um, Sort of access, uh, and, and so we're we're uh, actively looking at this, uh, but it, it it's it's not tied to any particular platform or protocol uh, because I think the space is is there, and different users will will need will have different physical uh, physical needs and physical platforms. So for us, it's really about the kind of uh, uh, the data layer and this opportunity to for the system to know where you are and what you're looking at. Um, it, it, it's sort of uh, uh, less appealing for me. For instance, if if we have to explain to the system, okay, well, I'm in the store now and I can't remember uh, which item I'm supposed to buy, or if I'm a, a tourist and I'm trying to to uh, learn something about the environment in front of me, um, if I have to sort of point everything out to 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 the AI uh, manually. Uh, so I, I think this is a great opportunity, um, and and uh, in a way, uh, all progress is good progress. Okay, thank you. And then uh, now, now uh, I think we can move on on, on social on gaming um, because what we see is that uh, more and more uh, VR it's not uh, an experience alone, but more and more interaction with people. And uh, for instance, at the last test built, Microsoft show uh, Microsoft Mesh, but all other companies are also oh uh, my uh, it's moving. Sorry, my slides are, are moving. Um, uh, and everything is moving uh, very fast. So, Tom, uh, how, how do you you see uh, volumetric capture in, in regards of social, on gaming, on how people interact with each other? Yes, I think I think it's an important one. Um, the, the, the social elements in a virtual world. Um, it's. It has shown there's there's a lot of production of 360 VR, for instance, and it's nice to do that. It's nice to look at it, but it's even much nicer if you could do, can do that together. Um, there are of course already a lot of applications that that providing that, but the question is how will that evolve? Um, volumetric capture is something that that we believe in as a addition. To what we've experienced today, avatars can be good for a lot of applications. Can be a good um, for a lot of social contact 
but we also believe that volumetric capture where you exactly um, in real time or um, film uh, capture the video of someone as they really are, uh, that adds a lot of um, elements in what you're showing. Especially, for instance, like today, uh, we never met before. I don't know how you look like. I, I don't see now how you react and so on. These elements are very important in a social interaction uh, when you meet new people, but also when you meet your friends. So that volumetric capture will add all of that. Um, you can compare that with video conferencing. When you, um, when you have a video of someone and you look at how they react, it's much more um, immersive and much more, you have much more contact with the other people uh, when you really see how uh, people are and how they react. So basically these elements, I think they are important, but they are still far away. This is not something that is today easily uh, implementable. There are not so many applications yet that prove that. And, and of course, Microsoft Mesh was a, a very big um, introduction, but still this is a development platform. This is not something that as a company you can go to and say, yes, now I want to deploy this and have this uh, uh, for a uh, level virtual uh, 2022. So this is still work in progress, um, but we see a lot of, of happening there. Um, as for instance, mobile phones with very good depth cameras and lidars um, that you could use to to, to capture the 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 volumetric image of of uh, someone someone's body someone's uh, torso. So I think this is really showing uh, uh, an advancement, but I also think that this is something that still needs some years to come. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think it's uh, the future of uh, all this also is to share the uh, mesh of, uh, of capture because uh, we need uh, all devices to work together and to be able to, to share what people uh, capture with their leader, with their devices, with things like that, in order to be able to, to have a great experience. Uh, what about you, Then, How do you see uh, volumetric in regard with social, maybe work and gaming? On your side yeah i think i think we have to differentiate a bit between like the full volumetric experience where you have an, a person captured with a very high resolution uh, which is i think for real time quite hard to do right now i mean when when we do a capture in our studio for example we have two terabytes of data per minute and this isn't something we we could easily tackle in real time in, in the very near future with 5G or whatever technology comes out for transmitting the data because the processing and everything is quite intensive. Um, so I think there will be like um, different forms of, I would say volumetric for social media where you where you have like, um, for example, we, we did a uh, metaverse for a big telecommunication provider in Germany. Um, we scanned the whole uh, headquarters of them with LiDAR scans and photogrammetry to use it as a reference for the whole tracking. We used the Unreal glasses uh, for the mixed reality content and created a software that everyone is basically completely in the same space and uh, they all connected with each other via 5G phones. So um, that, uh, um, this gave us op opportunity to really uh, see how interaction could work in such a space because there's nothing out of the shelf you can directly use. And yeah, I hope fully when Mesh is yeah, available for everyone, then, then it will also solve a lot of those issues or give tools to make it easier to create such environments. Um, but there we actually created an environment where we have all the, all the players basically see themselves with, with live tracking in this environment and we integrate a lot of different volumetric content like news anchors, uh, TV shows, and when you go over to a piano, you have a rock band playing there. And in this case, we simply used or we used volumetric uh, volumetric capture for those on-demand content once uh, a user started something everyone could see the same situation so everyone has the same, uh, same shared experience at the location which is great 
and everyone can see the other ones by uh, seeing their name tags on their bodies, tracking with them, and also like like uh, interacting with environments, like having mini games and so on. They're also going on, and um, this is very cool because it creates a social experience with all the people together. Um, and in this case, we used volumetric just for the main actors and the main persons. I think in the near future we will have more technologies, like already mentioned, with uh, phones which are able to use lidar scans and provide depth information to make, to create some kind of uh, yeah, more realistic representations of people in 3D spaces, but it will take still the time until we have uh, really full volumetric people in these environments being able to, to render it in real time. And th this is, I think, something which is uh, one of the challenging things. So I think in the, in the near future, we, we will rely on systems like Kinect and smartphones to create like a low lower quality representations in those environments, which is, I think, fine to get this live feeling and feedback from the persons. And uh, for the main content, maybe if you have a big venue, you will have some of the uh, main actors speaking there. They are pre-recorded and you can place them there. So you have the full experience in terms of quality. And I think for, for most of the audience, when they are there, it's totally fine to have like this lower end uh, representation instead of having this, this high end stuff. But this is really more like a, a technic technology journey when, when we will reach a step where we can really uh, create such content in this high resolution in real time. But this is still, yeah, still a journey to go. Yes, yes. I, I was talking um, at my first talk about um, Apple, who sold 100 million iPhone 12 in six months. It's huge. It's so many people with a leader in the hand yeah. that will be able to capture so much thing. It's really huge. Uh, and so uh, let's talk about uh, something that uh, lots of people are talking about is metaverse. In order to be able to go at scale, we, we, need, we, we have lots of leverage to capture things work each other uh, in the social way or in gaming way. Uh, how do you see the metaverse? And uh, do you think we will be able to have only one metaverse to share everything? Or uh, is, will we have a dedicated metaverse? And how do you see how we can work together between brands to be able to to move on and to have something common, like when Facebook come to web, uh, everybody went to Facebook because it's a way to, to be all together. How do you see Metaverse? Maybe Gabriel, you have uh, an idea? Sure, I, I, I see the Metaverse as, as very much uh, uh, parallel universes and we already live in this situation. Um, I think the, the hard part is uh, filtering out which, uh, uh, how to see only one metaverse at a time, or, or only two or three, uh, and not all of them. Uh, in, in other words, uh, speaking from an AR perspective, it's very easy and dumb to, to create a situation where all, all digital content is visible to you when you look at, uh, 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 you know, when you go outside and, and look at some, some street or, or, or some uh, uh, location. And, and we desperately don't want that. Uh, we really want the, the relevant information only to be there. Um, and maybe it, it, you, you have a certain interest in, in, in something, you have a historical interest or you have a practical interest, uh, or, or, or maybe you know, you're just kind of exploring and so you want some of that to be there. And, and so this kind of organizing of data is, is, is super, it's super exciting. And, and for me, the metaverse uh, is, is sort of this challenge of keeping things out uh, because uh, pretty soon we, we think everything, all the data will be available, uh, and, and, and that's like drinking from a fire hose. Great. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah, that's really great. And we are seeing very uh, leverage on this, all these technology, very, very interesting. Uh, I will have to, to move on, uh, and we can continue to talk about metaverse, and I would like to have your your ideas all all of you about what is coming next uh in the air for what is the most important things maybe it's uh, new devices hardware uh, interactions the way metaverse is moving on uh, I, I let you what do you think about what's coming and that will very trendy in the future uh, maybe Hervé, would you like to start yeah, I, it's always uh, difficult to limit it to one thing, but it, it's obvious that in the in the headset side, in the glasses, how you might call it, we, we still have a um, 
lot of room to uh, to progress to make it what we all want. Yeah, and something that, you know that looks like you know sunglasses um, and that is uh, autonomous, easy to use. Eventually, you know, connect to your phone, but that that is really you know easy to use for for everybody. So it's it's you know there we all familiar with the. Uh, stages in technology so it, it takes stages and we're going through that but uh, but yes the the, the 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 glasses will become smaller lighter there's, there's going to be you know there will be some big changes in display technologies um and um and we 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 know the direction oh yes it, it will be a huge uh progress if you have light uh, glasses and you also have great, great experience for me i would love to see also a neural interface that will change many ways to interact what about you tom what do you think uh, of what will be the next big thing in uh, in alternate realities mm -hmm. honestly i don't see much uh, big changes uh, upcoming um, but when I'm looking at the past, what what we exactly need to avoid is is see uh, um, early introduction of uh, of of stuff that is not of high quality, that is not um, very good to the user. Uh, we saw that, for instance, with, with with the Samsung Gear and so on. Yeah, it was it was quite okay, but uh, from a user point of view, it was not. Uh, it was just a gadget, and said. So that was a bit for most of the for as an introduction to virtual reality it was not a, the right way. So if this is going again with with um, other technologies that we require in the same way, it might uh, limit uh, even the the uptake of of these technologies. So what I'm saying exactly is um, the most important things that see see will see happening is indeed really good quality low cost uh, hardware and applications and, and applications can be business applications but also the games the games have been have um, the virtual reality games are really very good right now and not just adaptations of, of, of normal games but really from from the um, really built for virtual reality and you can see that and so it's it's important to have the hardware and the applications working together also. So is that is that the next big thing? No, it is the evolution. I think now we're in the era of of, of evolution of the virtual reality and everything that's happening, and to have a, a the really market uptake that we need, that we need to um, evolve and and to make sure that uh, that the stuff that that people want can be developed. Yes, yeah, agree. Seamless experience with quality and good user experience in order to, to like uh, VR and all, all, all this virtual reality. And what do you think, Gabriel, on your side? Um, I, I think I think we are. Um, I agree that we're going to see an incremental uh, change. I think it's 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 always going to be slow uh, uh, progress, but steady. Um, and so I, I guess I, I don't have much to add in this case. I, I really feel like the, the, I just share the excitement um, and and uh, am, am hopeful that it's a, a kind of responsible development, i.e. that we uh, we see uh, that the technology is done in a way that um, that allows uh, that's sort of inclusive. That, that would be my, my main request. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so more and more we are, more we will used to to use all these technologies and uh what about then what do you think i think uh, from from my perspective i think mixed reality will be one of the big things in the next year so now we have the first consumer mixed reality headsets on the market uh, since a few months in germany and uh, there are more like 10 different mixed reality headsets coming to the market by next year uh, all, all made for consumers and uh, not for business um, because previous devices were only made for business. I think this will be a, a huge uh, huge impact on how we use content, how we consume content and how we will communicate in the future. And I think this is a very int interesting topic in the next years which will come to us. Okay, thank you. 
Well, uh, I thank you to all for, for answering all these questions. Uh, we have lots of things to do in the AR, AR mixed reality to move on, but uh, everything seems to be very bright and interesting. And I hope uh, everyone like that. Thank you to all. Uh, I think we are finished and uh, I hope you will enjoy these sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice show. Thanks, everyone. Bien joué, sous prendre la main pour la suite. Merci, Jean-Philippe. So, um, it will now be the time for our, our expert lineup uh, with the village francophone and Cap Digital, uh, including Hervé Fontaine, David Perché, uh, Anthony Vitillo, and Massimiliano Ariani. Uh, you can go on stage. Est-ce que vous m'entendez dans la salle de conférence Oui. Ouais, alors j'y suis, et moi je fais comment alors Je vais sur la scène, c'est ça Ouais. D'accord, je vous envoie sur Quentin, d'accord. Et moi, par contre, ici, nous, on prend l'entrée, il y a des speakers qui sont dans le salle de conférence.
On, on vous entend, Marc Lionel. Que... Génial, vous vous entendez bien Oui. Bon, ben c'est trop bien. Allez, je vous laisse tout de suite. Voilà, je vous laisse tout de suite avec les speakers euh, qui ont le son. Et puis, euh, ça va être Ok, allez. On se voit d'abord. On se voit d'abord. On se voit d'abord. Tout le monde, on se dit, alors, en clair, en difficile. On va parler de ces fonctions de choc. Je vais couper son micro, on va voir s'il le remet. Anthony Massimiliano, you can go on stage if you're. Uh, yeah, we're there. Uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So, there's some problems with the slides, but <laughs> so, um, a little one, probably it's because of activities. Okay, so hello everyone. It's a pleasure to to be here together with you. I want to talk about how to develop an entertaining VR fitness game. And to do that, we'll talk about our game Hit Motion Reloaded and the choices we have taken. So who am I? I am Anthony Vitillo and I'm co-founder and CTO of New Technology Walkers. Uh, where I'm a developer and a consultant, and I'm also a blogger and I love to talk about AR and VR, everyone on the web, uh, with the nickname of Scarred Ghost. Max? I'm Massimiliano Ariani, and uh, I am a multimedia creative. One of the co-founder of work, China and game. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about uh, how to develop an entertaining VR fitness game, as I said, taking the example of our game Hit Motion Reloaded. And so we'll tell you the choices that we've taken while designing it so that you can maybe create your cool VR fitness game as well. So let's start from how the project has started. In 2016, Hit Motion was a game to showcase a full body VR system made with Kinect. And it was a game where you could use all your body, you could see objects appearing all around you in the space, you have to touch them with your head, with your hands, the feet, whatever you wanted. And the game was very simple, but at the same time, it was very fun. And we noticed that people moved a lot while playing it, and they sweat a lot, like if they went to, to the gym. So this was something that made us starting to think about the possible fitness application of it. So we also made a cool trailer for the first version of Hit Motion to showcase exactly these features.
And as you can see, I hope you can see the video, uh, there are targets coming towards the player and he can, she can touch them with all the whatever he wants and move along. So moving it further, we can talk about um, how it emotion has evolved it. So in 2019, we had the opportunity to collaborate with HTC that was launching the Vive Focus Plus. I was looking for interesting content to showcase the headset. And we proposed um, a new version of Hitmotion that could take the same spirit of making people move and having fun and staying fit in the process, adapting it to a new standalone headset. So removing the Kinect that was a very niche device. So we adapted heat motion so that people could move around the room, dodge objects, couching, and punching them just using the hands. So we uh, later on, we also launched it on, on SideQuest. It has happened just some weeks ago, and this is the trailer that we created for the SideQuest launch. And you can see that more or less, uh, it's always a person moving around the room, dodging stuff, and uh also punching objects and having fun so now i leave the word to, to max that is the game designer of the game that can tell you what have been the, the choices that he has made in the world process hi all as a game designer for the game goes to design a boxing training not only talk to people how to play boxing also be fun to play. The starting a set how to design the targets to proper to be fun to the user in the whole process. So of this make the game accessible also to the people that are not users. Just took the mine action also simplified them. We chose just three punch tape that look up adjusting the movement of the controller and all to understand if the punch direction. Yeah. Act problem. Problem is that the way of haptic feedback when the hit option loaded you all the link hour before Provide a list a sensation of that show audio feedback that tells the full or not. Is even user can feel the impact of the to understand the result of in now let's talk about how to find the end. Like in the fire cube, or still would be a punch in a wild game. You are your brain, would be opted so for a singular shape that remind of. Powerful are users in training to some 
Here we can the shape of the enemy in the also of it. Target is a here to punch it. Only tank, but also tank to the other. As we have said before, the system analysis of the third function by the punch in four. Punch at the right direction and port was given in point nine after the target at B. At B. Punch was correct but not fast enough. Wrong direction. Formed with wrong hand, wrong. Punch was not stopped. Here, taking in front of the user and audio visual feedback, tell the user what has been the purpose is bind the user to be fast. usually require a combination of series of the parts. Show the user a preview right part for the next action. Create a chain of so make the user perform a fast for a training or case some and we created this humanoid robot called bots that kindly welcomes to user and how to properly punch the targets is much and faster clear can emulate the physical movement of the character that you see in just see a picture. Bob can also become a virtual being that here and goes is like a real person. Come to the last point of our presentation. How to make this training fun and engaging? Decided to use gamification. Went to increase level with the player from one to three stars. AM to his Player can go on to the other user can change his words and the daily is make the user come back every day to change all fitness that we can. A fit while having fun. Also, our most. 
to increase the engagement for the user that have already played all the levels. Also added modifiers. to make the levels or to increase the required force to one can overtrain the tank motion load is on site play it to try yourself or the strategies that we have just told you Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure to speak with you about it motion. If you have any questions, of course, you can ask me and Max about it. Otherwise, you can just play the game on side quest and let us know your impression when you try it and verify also what Max has taught you today. Thank you. So if there are no questions, thank you. You are always here if you want to speak with us. So thanks for everything. Have a nice day. Bye. You can go, Mars, if you want. If you're ready. I think your mic is off. Can you, uh... 
Mar Marc Lionel, vous pouvez y aller. Hein, si... si votre micro est désactivé. Well, uh, I don't know if Mark uh, is here with us, but uh, if any uh, any of you could want to, to to continue to go on, uh, you can. Um, if not, we will, we will wait a little bit for for Mark and see if he responds. And uh, if not, at at uh, one p.m., we'll, you'll be able to one a.m. Sorry, you'll be able to to go and to have lunch and network. So if there is no one else and uh, Mark doesn't uh, respond, then uh, I think we can call it a break. And uh, we'll be back in this in this uh, auditorium uh, at 3 p.m. 3 and uh, 20, actually. So we'll have a nice break, eat well, and uh, hopefully we'll see uh, you uh, later on.